We just bless You in this place, Lord. We do thank You for Your goodness to us. And we thank You, Lord, that You don't judge things as men do. That You do look on the heart. That You look on the inner man. And we thank You for Your grace, Lord, and Your sovereignty uh, throughout history, Lord, and how You've moved and called and, and equipped Your chosen, Lord. We just bless You. And we thank You for blessing us. In Jesus' name, Amen. So this morning I am going to take a break from the series that we've been doing over the promises of God in Christ. Though I am going to run with a theme that we had picked up on last week. And so this, the sermon this morning is, Blessed is the man. And if you want to, you can turn to Psalm 1. We're going to be in Psalm 1, six verses. That's where we're going to be this morning. And I'm just going to kind of pick up on some of the things that we highlighted last week when we talk about blessing. Because we know that having been in Christ, we now receive all the blessings of faithful Abraham. Amen? And so we talked about blessing. We talked about how God had given His blessing to the creation in Genesis. All of God's creation of the different types of plants and animals. There was given a place to belong. A place to thrive and flourish and produce. There was favor. There was life. There was strength. There was fertility. The words prosper and provision would easily fit here. But prosperity and provision are just part of the fruit of the greater whole, we said. God pronounced His blessing on all His creation. But to man, we looked at and we saw that He communicated His blessing to them. As far as people are concerned, to be blessed by God is to be one of God's own people with all the benefits that brings. In other words, we said, the blessing of God is His relational presence in your life. And we looked at momentarily Genesis and the blessing of God's presence. We saw that God came to walk with His people in the garden. We saw that after the fall, the godly, such as Enoch, were described as walking with God. We saw that God spoke to Abraham and promised His personal guidance on the journey to the land that I will show you. Abraham is commanded to walk with God before, before God in His presence. To Isaac, he reiterated the covenant and his promises and his blessing when he said, I will be with you and will bless you. To Jacob, he said, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. <coughs> so we identified that if, if blessing is to walk with God, to be in an intimate relationship with Him, then to be cursed is to be separated from God. And we said, for all of Cain's faults, that he rightly discerned this, Cain, after being cursed of God, and, and said this, <clears throat> excuse me, if blessing is to be in relationship with God, to walk with God, who Himself is light and life, then to be cursed is not to be in right and intimate relationship with God. Again, after God cursed Cain, Cain summarized the curse as a loss of both benefits, meaning the things that, when we think about being blessed, we think about the material blessing that comes with that, the provision and even prosperity and abundance of things. But Cain identified the loss of both being driven away from the ground, its increase in its provision, meaning his livelihood, those things, a.k.a. materials. But he also identified something else. He said, in access to God, he, for he said, from your face I shall be hidden. The curse of God alienates one from God's presence while the very essence of divine blessing is, I will be with you. He's saying, I will be with you, Brian. I'll be with you, Tim. I'll be with you, Stephanie, Jennifer, Eric. I'll be with you, Caleb. I'll be with all of you. All of those who find themselves in Christ, He is with, for Christ is with you and gave Himself for you. We know you have been called to walk with God, which is the heart of all blessing. I really want you to understand that that is the heart of all blessing, that we've been called to walk with God. With the world ever looking for love and fulfillment in the wrong places, or to the wrong person, or to the wrong people, to fulfill in them only that which the person of Christ can fulfill. He is a friend who will never leave you nor forsake you. This is to be blessed. I ask you to turn to Psalm 1. Now, so we're running with the theme of what it means to be blessed. And Psalm 1 is interesting because it's a very short psalm, but it kind of sets the stage in, 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 for all the psalms that follow as, as David rightly looks at what it means to be blessed and he looks at what it means to not be blessed. He looks at what it means to be a godly man and be blessed of God and what it means to be ungodly. And these sort, this short psalm encompasses that. 
And so in Psalm 1, chapter, uh, excuse me, Psalm 1, verse 1, it says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chafe which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now if y'all bear with me for a minute, when I, when I read that, so I was preparing part four of the promises of God in Christ for much of Friday afternoon and then a lot of yesterday, and then I just really felt like I'm just going to set this aside and run a different direction. So uh, I'm thinking about this, and when I read the very first verse, "Blessed is the man that walketh in the counsel of the ungodly," "Blessed is the man that walketh not," excuse me, "in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful." Now, on the one hand, they're all describing the same thing: someone in all their ways not acknowledging God, but taking in the wrong thoughts and ideas and walking in those. But in another, you could say that there's a progression here. That at first they're just walking. And they're hearing the counsel of the godly. And they begin to walk in it. And then having walked by and heard it, they're now standing in it. And now they're not just standing in it. Now they're actually in company with and sitting in the seat of the scornful. But we say, but that's not the godly. That's the ungodly. Blessed is the man that walketh not in these things. But what happens when those that have once heard the truth and are standing in the goodness and blessedness of God begin to receive the wrong thoughts and begin to walk in those things? And, I, and for some reason in my mind, thinking about, I was just thinking about the fair or the carnival. Anybody ever been to a fair or a carnival before? And you've kind of got what we would consider seedy characters working all the booths, knowing that they're just trying to take your money and nobody's going to win that big teddy bear. I mean, occasionally there'll be one guy walking around with his girlfriend that's won it. You don't know how he did it because the game seems impossible. It's like Vegas. It's rigged. I'm telling you. They want people to have just enough thought in their mind that there's hope. But really, man, my goodness. Those rings aren't made to go around those bottles and those balloons. I don't know what they're made of, but they're not going to pop. But you're walking by and you know in your mind that you're not going to waste your money, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You've decided I'm going to go. We're going to ride a few rides because that'll be fun and exciting. And and you try to avoid walking by all the booths because they're trying to entice you to come if they're doing their job well. Come on! You know, and you're like, no, I'm not going to be enticed by that. But then you do. And the next thing you know, you're involved. They've got your money and, and, and and it's terrible. Because now you're, you don't have any money and you don't have anything to show for it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now just kind of take that at face value and, and how most people would approach that verse. I'm going to read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. And he's not, he's not directly commenting on this verse, but I think this is where it's easy for our minds to go when we think about just the ungodly. He says, if there is no intelligence behind the universe, then nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. He goes on, if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? And if I can't trust my own thinking, I can't trust arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God... I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve God. C.S. Lewis notes the atheist, which I believe fits the ungodly. But again, I asked this morning, what of the believer? So it's very easy for my mind to go that direction when I think about our universities and the professors and, and, and many of our public school, school institutions and many of the things being espoused and, and preached from all the different award ceremonies that the Hollywood elite throw for themselves. And you think, man, what group of people does that that much? Like, how many awards can you have? And then they get up there and preach to everyone. But, but all this junk coming in, right? And, and you've got all these people that maybe they're raised in a Christian home and how many young people go off to university and they lose their faith because of some um, man or woman who carries himself well and they hold their head up and they're espousing all these false truths that Paul says avoid science falsely so-called because many have been led astray thereby. 
But this is happening. And it's easier for me, for me to read this first verse and think about that. Sitting in the seat of the scornful. They're sitting in there behind their desk and laughing at the foolish, weak Christians. Christendom is it's a, it's a religion for the weak. They need a crutch, right? You've heard people, they need a crutch. But, but someone as intelligent as C.S. Lewis is saying, how could we even think if there wasn't a designer that had designed the brain? Otherwise, we can't trust any of our thoughts. Right? If there's not someone behind it, it's like, how can we trust justice if we can't rightfully identify who has established what's right and wrong? How do we determine that? There is no baseline. It is every man does what's right in his own eyes because who gets to determine what is right and what is wrong? Well, someone thankfully has already determined that for us. But again, I'm not moving to the direction of those that don't believe, but of the believer. Without doubt, we see in Scripture that we have an enemy. Everybody say, we have an enemy? We have an enemy. Do you believe He's real? I believe He's real. I believe that Paul and Jesus did not speak unnecessarily when they warned us against the wiles of the devil and they warned us to equip ourselves. They warned us to put on the armor of God. When we see Jesus being tempted, and if Jesus can be tempted, how much more so we? But that's one of the reasons that He's such a great high priest because He was tempted as we are so that when we're tempted, He fills that temptation with us and He cares for us and He's not... He's not stoic towards us in the sense of without care that we would be tempted by something. Like, you weakling. No, He understands. And that's why He's a compassionate high priest. Again, the godly is walking. And I'm not even talking about those lies that come from the college professors this morning. Though those, without mistake, are very real and very damaging and very impactful in our culture. But what about those of us here? We're not in university. None of the kids are even in public school that, that I'm aware of. But the enemy is still able to come and speak lies, isn't he? And it doesn't even have to be through television. You can just be going about your day and the enemy comes and whispers something in your ear. It could be about your brother or sister in Christ. He could try to manipulate and twist something that Dustin had said and now all of a sudden I'm letting my brain run not into nothing in the wrong direction feeling that Dustin has something against me when in reality he doesn't. But instead of going to him and clarifying and wanting to maintain unity, I let this build something that causes offense. And now, unbeknownst to Dustin, I'm walking in offense and I'm upset with him and he wonders why when we show up at church I'm, I'm behaving strangely towards him. This is real. I want to be very clear. Jesus said that He came to bring division, that there would be division. So, division's real. But He's not looking to cause division among His children. In that, He is absolutely clear that He would desire for us to walk in unity. That He has already granted unity of the Spirit. And that's why we've said before that you can meet someone you don't even know. And just because of the Spirit of Christ in them, you feel a connection. You sense your heart burning. Just like the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus whenever Jesus was with them, but He'd not been revealed to them. And when He did reveal Himself, they said, were our hearts not burning? They knew. But at the same time, in Ephesians, is why Paul writes, you've been given this unity, but the unity of the faith is something that's going to have to be worked towards. Where we come to the same understanding of all the things that God has given us in Christ. And how we walk that out and hope in that and believe in that. But if, if as the leaders of this church have espoused the unity of the church, not just amongst us, but amongst His church truly local, that there's real unity and power and seeing all God's gifts and children together and working together to the end of His kingdom being expanded, then how much so do you think the enemy would be working against that? At every level that he can between leaders, between leaders and those under them, between those that, you know, in the church towards each other, that there's always reasons for people to walk out of something with offense when we're not to give place to the enemy at all, the Scripture says. Now hear me. Again, just be very clear. Battle so often begins in the mind. I said that I believe, if you, if you would, that this verse is progressive in a sense that it starts in the mind and we begin walking the things that as Christians, what should we have done with those thoughts that were false? 
What should we have done with them? Well, Paul tells us what we should do with them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, it says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me tell you something. If you are walking with God, walking in that blessing and you're right with Him, you'll be right everywhere else. You can't help but be. You can't be walking with Him rightly and be wrong in other places. Not and be with Him rightly because if you're truly walking with Him and listening to His voice, He's going to show you. He's going to grab you and say, Stephanie, don't go that direction. Oh, sorry, but I, I didn't realize. Yes, okay, Lord, let's go. Because He loves you. And this is a journey and he's going to point just like Abraham. I'm going to go to the land that I will show you. He's taking you to a good land, not an evil land, a blessed land. And if we would only be sensitive to his voice in our life, sensitive to his word. And before I, before I, I move from this, I just because they come together and we're going to look at verse two a little bit. But that's exactly what verse two says. So if, if the blessed man, the godly man is to remain blessed and not let the enemy in. What will he delight in? It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and his law that he meditate day and night. The reason he is blessed, the reason that he doesn't take counsel with the ungodly, the reason that when those lies come in, he doesn't find himself walking and then standing and then sitting in the seat of the scornful and scorning everything that's being said. And this isn't the kind of music that I like. And this isn't. And did you hear Tim? And did you hear this? And man, so-and-so preached this morning. I don't really like when he preaches because he doesn't sound like so-and-so. And we become no better than the ungodly because now we're scorners. Nothing. Of, it's all about us rather than it being about Him. Hear me, it's easy to get there. It's a lot easier than you think. When he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, he's saying his delight is in the word of God. And Jesus is that word. And he meditates on it day and night. If the ungodly in all their ways, whether walking or standing or sitting or acknowledging ungodly counsel, then we as the godly are to acknowledge God in all our ways. From our waking up to our lying down. It's blessed to have the authority in Christ to take wrong thoughts captive. How many of you realize that's a blessing that not everyone can do that? That in Christ, because of His grace, you can take wrong thoughts captive and say, that's not true. I don't have to sit here and stew and allow this lie to produce something in me that it was never intended to. Because I have the authority in Christ to squash that lie. I have the ability and the grace and the mercy of Christ at work in my life that I don't have to stand where Adam stood when he didn't take dominion over the enemy. We can repeat the process and be in the same place as Adam and Eve who were standing blessed in God and sharing fellowship. Or we can lose fellowship because we believe the lies of the enemy and allow things to be produced in us that were never meant to. That dominion that was lost has been regained. Blessed to be walking with Christ. Blessed to be standing in Christ. Blessed to be able to sit in His arms. Blessed to have the grace to be able to renew your mind. You're blessed. Anybody, remember what, anybody here remember what they were like before they got saved? Does anyone remember that? Has anyone ever talked to someone who's not saved and just feel astounded that they can't see what you see? That's what it's like to have an unrenewed mind. I, don't, I still remember what it was like to have an unrenewed mind. And I'm thankful that He's given me a new mind, a new heart with new desires that I don't have to think those ways that I can see things that I couldn't see before. It's not something to get proud of. It's something to, that gratitude ought to well up over. Have you ever seen those little wooden cutouts? I remember the first time I saw one. And the only ones I've seen have had to do with the name of Jesus. But it's got raised almost like you would think you were looking at hieroglyphs or, or something in Chinese so, so that if you don't look behind the raised imprint, you can't see the letters. Anybody ever seen what I'm talking about? There's one, there was one over there by uh, off 174 near a mechanic shop. I remember they had that, that word Jesus. 
And I think it was my aunt and uncle that had given my parents one. And, and it was so funny because my parents, after they saw it, was like, oh, there it is. And I'm like, what is it? I don't see it. And they're giggling. Oh, you know, and I'm like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like, and you're almost limited because like, oh, I can't go back. Now all I can do is see you. Okay. But we don't want to go back. We're not like we're not like the Israelites that are like, take us back to Egypt. I don't. I want to unsee what I've seen. I want to unknow what I know now. No, we we're very thankful to know what we know. We don't ever want to go back. I'm not because I. You know, you could flesh just this part out so much. I just I just want to be clear, guys, that don't let the enemy in. Make sure that your feelings are being led of the truth and not your food, your feelings leading when they're not based on truth. God gave us emotions and He gave us feelings and they're good, but they're not good when they're based on a lie. That let the truth reign. Take things captive. Don't let false offense set in. And if there is something that has happened and you're not sure, it's this relationship is a covenant relationship just like your marriage. And how many of you know marriage is hard work and it takes grace and it takes forgiveness and it takes sometimes saying I was totally wrong and I was being a jerk. And sometimes it takes coming together and saying what did you mean by that when you said that that's not what I meant? Okay, well I misunderstood you. I'm glad we talked about that. And I would expect the same level of willingness to do those kind of things to make this covenant relationship work that I would desire to see a marriage work. No less, because I think God spilled His blood for this covenant relationship. And it's very important to Him. We said, verse 2, but His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. How does the godly man ward off the lies and counsels of the enemy? He delights in the Word of God. Anybody here delight in anything? What do you delight in? What do you find? I mean, just that word. What do you delight in? I've shared this before. I can tell you something that I delight in. I delight when I feel a fish on the end of my line. It is a sensation like no other. I delight in it. I delight in on a sunny spring day when I can sit outside of my front porch and drink a cup of coffee and it's not too windy that it's blowing the pages of my Bible all over the place. I delight in it. It's refreshing. It's something different. I, I don't get to do it often. Most Texas days are either too hot or when it's cold, it is cold and I don't want to sit out there in that. Or, you, or, or it is a spring day, but the wind is blowing and you're sitting out there and you're like, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's, that's not working. Can't. Okay, well, I'm going to take this back inside. I delight in that. I delight when my children wake up and they're joyful. <laughs> As opposed to, like, whoa, why is today different than yesterday? I don't understand. I delight when they wake up and there's, there's soft giggles in the house. I delight in that. What do you delight in? Well, the Bible says the blessed man delights in the word of his Lord. Delights in it. It's not a burden. Anybody ever felt that this was burdensome? I would be lying if I said I hadn't. I can tell... But I can count. I can't count on two hands the number of times in my mind I knew that there would be relief if I would go and pick up my Bible. But the Bible seems like such a weighty book. Like, well, you really got to have your thinking cap on. And man, I, I just don't want to do that right now. Like, ah, oh, let's just walk by that. Let's go do something where I'm not required to think. But the godly man delights in it because he knows there's life to be found in it. And he can combat the enemy with it. Listen to this story. David A. Siemens in Instruction for Thanksgiving shares this story. He says, During the Depression, William Stidger was, an, was in a restaurant with friends who were all talking about how, how terrible things were. There were suffering people. Rich people were committing suicide. There was joblessness. The conversation got more miserable as it went on. A minister in the group interrupted. In two or three weeks, I have to preach a sermon on Thanksgiving Day. He said, what can I say that's affirmative in a period of, of a world depression like this? Stidger felt the Spirit of God saying to him, why don't you give thanks for those people who have been a blessing in your life and affirm them during this terrible time? He began to think about that. He remembered a school teacher who was very dear to him. A wonderful teacher of poetry and English literature 
who had gone out of her way to put a great love of literature and verse in him, which has affected all his writings and his preaching. So he sat down and wrote a letter to this woman who was now up in years. It was only a matter of days until he got a reply in, a, uh, in the feebly scrawl of an aged woman. And it said, My dear Willie, I can't tell you how much your note meant to me. I am now in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely, and like the last of a le- leaf of an autumn lingering behind. You'll be interested to know that I taught in school for more than 50 years. And yours is the first note of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue cold morning. And it cheered me as nothing has done in many years. He says, I'm not sentimental, but I found myself weeping over the note, he said. Then he thought of a kind bishop, now retired, who had recently faced the death of his wife and was all alone. This bishop had taken a lot of time giving Stigger advice and counsel and love when he first began his ministry. So he sat down and wrote the old bishop. In two days, a reply came back, My dear Will, your letter was so beautiful, so real, that as I sat reading it in my study, tears of gratitude fell from my eyes. Before I realized what I was doing, I rose from my chair and I called my wife's name to share it with her, forgetting she was gone. You'll never know how much your letter has warmed my spirit. I've been walking around in the glow of your letter all day long. My question to you this morning is, how about you? Like this teacher and retired bishop delighting in the letter from Stidger, do you you delight in God's Word to you? Do you meditate on it throughout your day, taking pleasure in it? Do you let it warm your spirit? Do you take it like a love note? That one that was written by Katie that I remember when you were dating... And you just couldn't wait to be married. And, if, and, and you received a letter and you would pour over it and over it and over it and over it and just delighting in that they had taken the time to write you. Maybe that was just me. Do you walk with the Word like the disciples again on the road to Emmaus with the resurrected Savior presence making your heart burn within you? Verse 3 says, And He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit in His season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I want you to note when we read that, that the tree is planted. That means it's chosen. You know, this isn't a wild tree. It didn't, it didn't grow up in the wild. It's a tree that God chose. He went shopping. He chose you. Now He's planting you. You're called. You already know that you've been purchased. That means you're cared for. You're tended to. A Serbian bishop, Nikolai Vilamorvic, spoke out against Nazism in the early 1940s. And for that, he was arrested and taken to Dachau concentration camp. And there he prayed this prayer. Bless my enemies, O Lord. Even I bless them and I do not curse them. Enemies have driven me into your embrace more than friends have. Friends have bound me to earth. Enemies have loosed me from earth and have demolished all my aspirations in the world. Just as a hunted animal finds safe shelter, finds safer shelter than an unhunted animal does, so have I. Persecuted by enemies, found the safest sanctuary, having ensconced myself beneath your tabernacle, where neither friends nor enemies can slay my soul. Bless my enemies, O Lord. Even I bless them and do not curse them. What is he saying? He's saying, because of this, it's only drawn me closer to you. This is really a test that when we're persecuted, where we really are in Christ, that are we truly trusting Him and walking with Him? When, when things hit the fan, does it draw us closer to Him or push us away? We've said before, the illustration uses like the tube of toothpaste. You don't really know what's in it till you squeeze it. And when you're squeezed, if you're rightly walking with Him, you know what that's going to do? It's only going to draw you closer. We've said before, it's like the man that put on the parachute in the airplane and put it on for the wrong reasons because he was told that if he put the parachute on, it would provide greater, a greater degree of comfort. Well, when turbulence hits and you've got the parachute on, if you're looking for comfort, <laughs> it doesn't seem very comforting. Not in the sense of being relaxed. But if you're told put it on because we're afraid there's going to be trouble with the plane and we might have to jump out, I assure you, when turbulence hits, you're not going to be upset with the parachute. You're just going to cling tighter, Right? Why did you put Jesus on? Why are you walking with Him in a world that's 
given over to sin and we know is perishing. Blessed are you, Jesus said, when you are persecuted and reviled for His sake. Blessed, I say. Blessed to be planted by the source of life. Blessed to be able to bring forth fruit in its season no matter the situation. How could Paul and Peter see converts while in prison? Don't they know that that's not blessed to be sitting in prison? Well, they were blessed because of who sat with them when they were in prison. And because of that, they could still bring forth fruit even while sitting in the direst of circumstances. Just like this bishop, just like this priest who was preaching against Nazism could bless his enemies because it drew him closer to his Savior. Now, the story didn't share it where I had found this story at, but I bet there were others that were touched by the way he conducted himself during that. And I'm going to just touch on these last three verses to get, or excuse me, the, yeah, these last three verses, verse 4 through 6. It says, The ungodly are not so, meaning they don't prosper like the blessed man does. Instead, they are like chafe, which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Again, he says, the ungodly are like chafe, sitting, sulking, scorning, not bringing forth fruit, but withering away to nothing, but that which the wind carries away. How sad is it? Anybody ever met an embittered elderly person before? Anybody ever met someone like that? How sad is it that not only has their body shown the signs of living in a fallen world, but their very attitude and spirit show as much as well. When on the other side, have you ever met someone who's thriving in Christ in their old age? And what a blessing and a, a, just a glow comes from them and what it is to be around them that even at that season in life, there's still fruit that's coming forth because of the Spirit of Christ in them. But again, the ungodly are not so. And so I caution you, my friends, how easy. I've met professing Christians in the seat of the scorner. This is not unique just to the ungodly. For we've made enemies of the enemy of Christ. And in that, He seeks to stop the work of Christ in your life. He seeks to speak lies. And if you're not combating with the truth, how easily and readily we find ourselves on the wrong side. And we think, how did I get here? Well, we get there by not delighting in Jesus and not delighting in His truth. How many of you know, since I was a young man, there have been a lot of school shootings? Anybody know that? There's been a lot of school shooting in the States. The one that always comes immediate to memory because it's when I was just coming of age is the one that happened in Colorado. And <clears throat> Bill Glass, writing in 2006, says this, the 17 kids who shot classmates in schools in various parts of the United States, and I just, I'm, I'm giving a backdrop because he's writing this in 2006 and many school shootings have happened since then. So, But he says, the 17 kids who shot classmates in schools in various parts of the United States had one thing in common. They had a, pro man, y'all forgive me. <coughs> mm. They had a problem with their dads. A conclusion that was drawn by the FBI after studying the high school shooters in Paducah, Kentucky, Pearl, Mississippi, and Littleton, Colorado. When a man doesn't get along with his father, it makes him mean. It makes him dangerous. It makes him angry. Writes formal NFL pro Bill Glass, who has 36 years of prison ministry experience. He continues, on the day before Father's Day, I was in North Carolina in a juvenile prison. I ate lunch with three boys. I asked the first boy, is your dad coming to see you tomorrow on Father's Day? He said, no, he's not coming. Why not? He's in prison. I asked the second boy the same question and got the same answer. I asked the third one why his dad wasn't coming and he said, he got out of prison about nine months ago and he's doing good. I'm proud of my father. He's really going to be a good dad to me. And he's going to get straight. 
He was protesting, when I read this, I thought of you but just because of a line you had said. He was protesting, I just protest too much. He was protesting so much that I could tell something was wrong. So I asked, how many times has your father been here to see you since you got out nine months ago? Well, he hasn't made it yet. Why not? Well, he lives, he, he, he lives away, way, way away. Well, where does he live? In Durham. Well, Durham was only two hours away. I had come 1,500 miles to visit this boy. But his dad couldn't come two hours. A lot of fathers are really deserters. When I'm in a prison, I always challenge the inmates to bless their kids. If you want to keep your kids out of prison, bless them. Why do I share that story? Because God has blessed you. Think about it for a moment. So many dads can't even get up off the couch to bless their children. They can't be bothered to turn away from the TV to bless their children. And yet God traversed time and space, put Himself in this broken down earthen vessel just so that He could reach us. He did it for you to be received. He did it for you to be loved. He did it for you to be known. He did it for you to be blessed. For you to be blessed because you walk with God. I love the statement that says that Jesus is worthy of the reward of His suffering. He's worthy for us to walk with. He's worthy for us to meditate upon. He's worthy for us to delight in. He's worthy for us to combat the lies when the enemy comes and tries to say something that you know is not according to His truth. With His grace, how do I say this without it seeming wrong? You can be the biggest person in the room. And what I mean, you can still be very meek, but the biggest because you're standing with the one who is the most sound, the most whole, the most wholesome. That you're not easily moved. You're a tree planted by rivers of waters. That when everything else is being blown like chafe because it has no solidity to it, it has no grounding to it, it has no foundation to it, you can still stand. When everyone else is running around like a chicken with its head cut off, you can stand. Because God's Word carry weight with them. They carry wholesomeness. They carry soundness. They carry value. They carry authority. And He's given that to you. He's given you Himself so that you would not be easily shaken. You would not be easily moved. Though all about you is in turmoil. And He's calling you to fight the good fight of faith. And to run this race well. To stand in Him. And when the enemy comes, to combat the lies of the enemy with the truth and say that's not true. And even if what you're saying is true, I'm not going to let it create bitterness in my heart because I'm going to be the bigger man in Christ. I'm going to reach out to Craig and I'm going to ask Craig if this is true. Why? Because I care about Craig and his health. I care about Eric and his health. I want to see him in a strong place in Christ. I want to see his marriage thriving. I want to see his children thriving. I want to see the church that he's involved in thriving. God bless each one of you. I'm asking you this morning to don't let the lies of the enemy put you in a place where you begin to walk in them. As soon as you hear them, put them in their place. Let me give you one last antidote for my own life. And this doesn't even have to do with professing the Word of God. It just has to do... When you don't know what to profess, pray. I remember going to my mom's home <clears throat> and because of the nature of our relationship, she could always be very open with me. <coughs> and I had come in and I was very upset about something. And y'all bear with me if you've heard this story before. It's okay, I'm going to tell it again. I don't remember, I don't remember today, I don't remember what I was upset about, but I was upset, visibly. And I was feeding that anger. Anybody ever fed that anger? Like, I don't, I'm not ready to be done yet. Like, and my mom looked at me, she said, Jason, this isn't right. You need to pray. And I was like, pray? 
because I had vented to her hoping to have an accomplice in my anger, right? Like someone that would join me. But she said, no, Jason, you're not right. You need to pray. Pray. She's right. I need to pray. Do you know what happened when I prayed? I didn't have any word of God that I was standing on, but you know what happened when I prayed? That anger subsided. <laughs> and I wasn't able to stand in it anymore. I wasn't able to feed that beast that was <laughs> trying to get the best of me. And I quickly realized that what I was angry about really wasn't worth being angry about. It wasn't righteous anger from God by any stretch of the imagination. If you're not sure where to stand, maybe you've not been meditating that day. Maybe the enemy has tried to create some cloud of confusion. What he can't stop you is from speaking out to the one who's standing there with you. So just speak out to him. Cry out to him, Lord. And you know what? He'll be there in your time of trouble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just bless you in this place, Lord. We just pray against the works of the enemy. I pray for all your children in this place and all your children abroad, Lord. That for all the places that division is, that has happened that is not of you, Lord, we rebuke it. We stand with you, Lord. We pray for your children to confront the lies of the enemy. And to realize that your blood is worthy of fighting. Fighting for truth. Fighting for unity, Lord. Fighting for the communion that we share together in you. I just pray that as brothers and sisters, Lord, that we would all fight. Lord, we thank you for the battle and the victory that is ours in you, Lord. That you've already won it. If we would stand in you, walk in you, sit with you, not walk in the way of in the counsel of the ungodly, not stand with sinners, Lord, in their congregation, and not sit with the scorners, Lord, but to be with you. I bless you in this place in Jesus' name. Amen.